I want you to go to James. We're preaching through the book of James. I want to preach to you tonight, Patience in Oppression, Patience in Oppression. But I want to I wanna teach a lesson before the lesson from James chapter 5, beginning of verse number 7. We preach to this point. Would you stand, please? Would you stand, please? How many of you are praying about the Kennedys, whether they're the Lord's will for our church? Okay, lots of you. Good, that's great. Here we go. Verse number 7. James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, or until the coming of the Lord, or through until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman, somebody yell out, what's a husbandman? It's a farmer, okay? Waited for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, second time the command's made. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Second time mentioning that the Lord's coming. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Third time mentioned the Lord's coming. Take, my brethren, the prophets who... Let me say that the, way, the right way. Take, my brethren, the prophets, or remember them, who hath spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy or blessed which endure. Ye have, not, ye, ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The lesson before the lesson is this. We began in verse number 7. If you were not here last week and you did not hear us preach through the book of James and beginning in, especially in, in chapter 5 I could preach this paragraph totally saying stuff about be patient maybe preach on the coming of the Lord something like that talk about affliction a little bit and everybody in the place would say amen and you would go home and you would think that you had got the thinking of the word of God, but you would have not. The lesson before the lesson is this. This paragraph is extremely rooted in the last paragraph and cannot be understood out of context for what the Lord originally meant it to mean. And the crime of topical preaching that pulls a paragraph out of context is that you do not really understand what, where the Lord was headed when he said something. So that you yank it out and preach a passage like this about patience or something and don't get at all what the meaning is. So let's really preach the meaning. You may be seated. All right. The beginning of Chapter 5, I remind you that we preached in, in two parts last, from verse number 1 to verse number 6, is a scalding rebuke to wicked men who idolize riches, who get riches by defrauding other people. Remember, they skimmed wages and they hoard riches for their own indulgence in light of it being the last days when they should be using their finances for what? The kingdom of God, for the gospel's sake. Instead of that, they're heaping up the riches for themselves. The paragraph to, wicked, to the wicked rich men ends in verse number 6 and with a very passive statement about the people that they are oppressing. Okay, guys, I'm getting a little bit too much on the monitors. If you back that up just a little bit, back it off just a little bit. And the, the, to, to those that they are oppressing, verse 6 comes, it says, Ye have condemned and killed the just, talking about rich men, and he doth not resist you. The idea is the, those that they've oppressed, those that they steal wages from, those that they, they even kill to take their money so that they keep heap up treasure, those just people were not resisting them at all. And then in the idea of that wicked rich man, that paragraph, immediately it goes into the exhortation in verse number 7, be patient therefore, as uh, Josh Kennedy so aptly told us on Sunday night, the therefore tells you that what is being said now is based on what has just been said. And in light of these wicked rich men and how the just were supposed or, or did not resist them, here comes the command, be patient, therefore. Therefore, because of the promise 
in verse number four, be patient because it's not up to you to revenge or avenge yourself or to get back your riches that were stolen. It's up to the Lord of, yell it, come on, Sabaoth. Not the Lord of, Sab, of the Sabbath, not the, day, the Lord of rest, the Lord of Sabaoth, the rest, the, or the Lord of the war, the Lord of the hosts of the armies of God who are going to bring down judgment against wicked men hoarding riches, idolizing riches, skimming wages, oppressing the just. Be patient, be patient. So we get into the next paragraph and understand that it's directly rooted in the last. Patience here, while a person is being taken advantage of, like you are being taken advantage of, it means to forbear or long bear, long forbear the wrong. To endure it, we'll see that word pop up later. Not to do anything about it. To endure it. To respond the right way during it. You see the command of be patient again in verse number 8. Be also patient like the farmer. We'll get to that in a second. It is really the idea, this being patient in the middle of being taken advantage of, is really the idea of what the Lord had said to turn the other cheek when someone smites you, that you are enduring it and not deciding to smite them back because of a reason in this chapter, because you're full of the faith that the Lord of Sabaoth is coming to avenge you, that he will make the wrong right. And being full of the faith that you're going to let that thing in the hands of the Lord, you're, a, you're able to be patient and you're able to endure it not patience like your, your, your child is, you know, oh, how I know how the child screams. Oh, how I know. I could write a poem on that, Shakespearean poem with my five children. Oh, how I know the child screams. That's how it's going to start. This isn't talking about patience about your children or your coworkers or waiting in 95 in traffic. It's talking about endurance through being taken advantage of, through your wages getting skimmed by treated, being, being treated wrongly in some ways. You know, being patient and waiting for the Lord to take care of it. Let it sink in, please, that the Lord wants us to turn the other cheek and be patient and wait for the Lord of Sabaoth to do something about it in full faith that he will. And that I don't have to do anything. I struggle just a bit with the conundrum, that's a great word, that this presents among American full-righted citizens among us who are full of our own rights and we are full of mechanisms of justice in the United States of America. We have a multitude of choices, unlike these people, of what we can do when someone does something wrong to us. We can sue them in court. We can, uh, we can strike against them and get other employees to rise up against the employer, unjust employers. We can blow the whistle, you know, and turn them in somewhere to some government agency. But folks, what we need to come square in the face with tonight is that that doesn't mean we always should. Because we live in an incredible place and have the Bill of Rights and we have all these rights and mechanisms of justice around us is not the approval of the Lord of those who are to act like Jesus Christ to push the button of the mechanism to get justice. In fact, his exhortation here, and if you think about it in so many other places, is to be patient and let the Lord do it. Let the Lord do it. I explored many of the thoughts of, of that American rights and justice kind of thing in light of these verses, and my conclusion may surprise you, frankly. I believe the view here... Let me read it first before I read this again. Verse 7 and 8. Now, in light of what I'm just telling you and how it's connected, and it's talking about the guy who's oppressed in verse number 1 through 6, especially in verse number 4, the higher the laborers is, is reaped down, uh, 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 who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud. Okay, in light of the guys being oppressed in, in verse 6, the just man who is killed for his money, verse 7, be patient, therefore... Brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, wait for the Lord to revenge. Wait for the Lord to come and do it. Behold, the husband and husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the latter, the early 
and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. The Lord of the Sabbath is coming to make the wrongs right. In light of this, I believe the view here is of the Lord of the Sabbath who hears the, us being taken advantage of, you be, being taken advantage of, the hire, the, you know, the laborer being taken advantage of. And the command comes from the Lord not to push all the mechanisms of justice that we have at our disposal by the Bill of Rights, but rather to be patient. Be patient. Forbear. Endure with the right response, the idea is. That command to be patient should cause the American Christian in many situations to defer his rights. That he does not have to sue. That he does not have to publicly blow the whistle if he's being taken advantage of in favor of allowing the Lord of the Sabbath to take care of many injustices. Deferring folks in patience when being taken advantage of is godly. It is godly. It is a full of faith statement that the Lord is a better revenger than the federal government. That the Lord is better to take care of me than the police. That the Lord is better to take care of me than the Supreme Court. That I believe that there is the Lord of the armies of the hosts. And I believe that he will make every wrong in my life right. That he will revenge every time that I've been taken advantage of. And that brings me to comfort and patience. I ask you how many last week or the week before, how many of you have been feel like you've been taken advantage of sometime by an employer. Many of you raised your hands. You know, you don't have to make that thing right. There is a God who's going to make it right. It's very hard to fetter out those thoughts in light of, of for instance, being in a situation where other people have been re, uh, uh, involved and had been wronged, and you feel like you're trying to help them. It's very hard to fetter out this be patience in light of crimes that are laws against our land. Of course, you can't you can't fail to report crimes. But understand that the Lord's justice is more real than the police, the court, etc. And it is not the Lord's will that we should always use all of our rights to bring justice on an oppressor. That we should do everything that we can do. It's not the Lord's will that we should do everything that we can do to get back or to make things right. We should have full faith in the Lord of the Sabbath. I want to make clear just one point. I want to make a time out. There's something that you probably are not aware of that, that is in fundamentalism going on that you may not be aware of that is very real right now. Unless you're a reader of blogs and whatever, things that great pastors of churches and great churches have been involved in. Colleges like Northland, Bob Jones University, and others have been accused and been involved in. And that is those that did not stand up for victims of abuse. And I want to I just really be clear on this matter so you understand. When I'm talking about being patient through oppression, I'm not talking about those that are being abused. I want to make clear that crimes of abuse of any sort are our obligation under law and under conscience and under scriptures to report and prosecute. And unfortunately, there are many fundamental churches, some of great reputation that have had things that have happened in their own churches that they have the good old boy uh, kind of I'm not going to get the deacon in trouble or the pastor in trouble or the Sunday school teacher in trouble so we're going to keep it in house and not report abuse that's ridiculous sin it is a crime against all right now of that sin brother Crichton would you say amen to that for those of us who are behind the scenes in ministry and are and are obligated to keep up with these things you know I'm ashamed of many uh, of, of those that I once respected for some of the things that have gone on and dis decisions they have made not to do what is right. We must harmonize, though, uh, the times that we must make legal action and legal reporting with the command that is here, that we are to be patient and to endure when we are being in, uh, taken advantage of. And it's hard to harmonize. And, and, uh, but the word of God is, is very clear here. Notice even in the, in the last phrase of verse number 6. And he, the just man who you've taken advantage of, doth not resist you. Think of how many times that you can think of in your brain in the Gospels that have 
sayings like this, that you're not to resist or that you're to suffer wrong or to allow yourself to be wrong or to turn the other cheek or, or things like that. You know, the scripture is full of this. This is the attitude of godliness. The employee here, in verse number four, the just man who's being killed for his wages is not resisting and not fighting back. And God says that's right. Although the employer is skimming his wages, he has committed the issue to the Lord. The Lord to get back his money or not, or just to make it right when he comes. I know that's hard for any American to hear. We grasp our Bill of Rights. We grasp it as close as we, we grasp the Bible sometimes. I got my rights. You're not going to take away my assault rifle. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I slipped into that. I don't know. I don't know how I slipped into that. That's a different sermon. In this Roman culture of, verse, uh, of James chapter 5, it is likely that these people had no legal place to go. Okay, that kind of gums up the issue too. That kind of, kind of makes it a little rough. They, they couldn't just go to your, your, you know, your local Roman centurion and say, and hey, this guy, he didn't care. All right? This was not, they're not going to send out social services. They're not going to, you know, you can't file, you know, and... and Pettit court, you can't do it, you know, they don't care. We have too many places to blow the whistle. So I would, I would just think that this would apply more to the innocent, to the person who, who really doesn't have any fair recourse sometimes, but certainly it applies to all of us. Notice verse number seven, what it says. It says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, at the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the, uh, of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the, rad, and the latter rain. Okay, this is beginning talking again about you know, the Lord of the Sabbath knowing he's going to come under the coming of the Lord. The Lord is going to revenge all the wrongs. It is okay to commit that injustice solely to him. It is okay to quiet yourself and just give it to the Lord when you've been done wrong. The illustration is about the eastern farmer. How many of you know about the early ladder range? You know something about that. You've seen that in the Bible somewhere. Okay, so, so basically in that ecosystem, you know, there's, there's a, a beginning rain at the time of the harvest, and there's, there's a half harvest taken, if I'm getting this right, and then there's a ladder uh, rain where the rest of the harvest, and, and when, the, when the farmer is counting his entire harvest, he, ha he has to understand that he's got to wait for both rains. That's what verse number seven is saying. And just like this farmer who is waiting for the early and the latter uh, rain, you need to be patient for the Lord to, do the, to, to, to make right the wrongs that have been done against you and not get impatient and try to do it yourself. And not get bitter and not get angry. And not try to strike back. Not think that you've got to do something. Hey, the Lord can handle it. Can he? Doesn't he have a right to? Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we feel like we are so filled with rights that we're the one that needs to revenge. We're the one that needs to do something. This is saying, be patient. The Middle Eastern farmer had long patience waiting for that fruit at the end. So we must have long patience sometimes until the Lord deals with the oppressors of our lives. Again, the command is given. Once again, in verse number 8, be also patient like the farmer. And then it says this, establish your hearts. Listen, the topical preacher would have preached this completely different. It would not have been connected at all to the first part, but it's what God meant in this. Establish your heart. You know somebody who's been done wrong and how they're all agitated and they want to get justice and they're, they're just bothered with this and they're constantly, this is on their mind and, and they got to figure out how they're going to figure it out and they got to figure out and they want to uh, get back and, and, and take care of the wrongs. And, but establish your heart, the word of God means. It means Get a hold of, be firm, stable, make your mind firm. Not all agitated with, with fear and anger and revenge and bitterness because, because you've been oppressed. It's the picture of someone who's skitzing out, who the Lord says, trust the Lord of Sabbath to make the wrongs right. And you establish your heart. You wait for it. You be patient. You quiet your heart. Stop worrying about that. Stop trying to do something about that. Quiet your heart. Make your heart firm. Establish your heart. God says you shouldn't give in to all the negative thoughts of a victim mentality because you have justice on the way. I like that phrase, justice on the way. That's why I keep talking about the coming of the Lord. That's exactly why I keep talking about the coming of the Lord. The Lord of Sabbath is coming to make the wrongs right. Establish your heart. Be patient. Wait for it. 
And let it be well with your soul. I'm a person that likes to get things done like swatting flies. I mean, I, I'm afraid that I'm going to forget something, so I want to answer emails immediately. I want to, if I got something on my mind, I got to send it to the email the office and get it done and whatever. And I got, listen, when a person's been done wrong, you can't be that kind of person that wants to get it done now. You got to just hand it over to the Lord. You got to get your hands off of it, you got to get your mind off of it. You understand what I'm saying? Are we here tonight? You know, the, the Lord will deal with the oppressor. Three times up to this point, verse number 8, the Lord has made mention of His coming four times when it gets to verse number 9. It starts way back up there in verse number 4, I believe. Four times. Folks, listen, we have a faithful God who is coming. We have a faithful God that's not going to forget your situation. All right? You don't have to keep reminding him. He is going to make the wrong right. You don't have to keep on trying to get back at the oppressor. Justice is on the way. We have a faithful God who will make all wrongs right. When we are oppressed, the Lord's return will come. It should immediately comfort us. Let me say it this way. When you think about whether you're some employer that's doing you wrong or some supervisor or whatever or, or someone that you feel like is bullying you or someone who's oppressing you in some way or whatever, you know what you need to think about? The Lord's return. You need to think about the Lord is going to return and make the wrongs right. That's what you need to think about. That should comfort your heart. That should establish your heart. That should make you patient so you don't feel like you've got to agitate yourself, all, all yourself up and do something about it. I had a friend, his name was Timmy Rowe. He was a red-headed fireball. He was sent from the Lord to keep me alive and so I could be your pastor one day. Because every time I would get into trouble, I'd look for Timmy. And I had a big mouth. You say, you still do, Pastor. I had a big mouth and I could get myself into trouble. And I'd get myself into trouble and there were times, this is a true story, when I'd have a couple guys in high school that would, would, would come around me, surround me. One guy I told, his name was Michael. I'm not going to, it's his video, I better not say his last name. And he was tr trying to get me out in the parking lot so they could beat the tar out of me. And I was in a heap of trouble. And I was going, I was going down fast, I'll tell you fast. And then all of a sudden, Timmy Rowe came into the room. Everyone was afraid of Timmy Rowe because he could fight like a banshee. And he was mean as a junkyard dog. And he didn't care at all. And he broke arms regularly. And I remember seeing him trying to fight a drunk man with a cast on his arm. But that's a whole other story. So when I would see getting myself into trouble and I'd see Timmy Rowe coming, I knew it was going to be okay. For some reason, Timmy liked me. He still likes me. We were college, we were college roommates. And, and it was going to be okay because Timmy was on the way. Now listen, some of you have been done wrong. It's going to be okay. The Lord is on the way. He's going to take care of it, not you. He's going to fight your battle for you. You can trust him to do it. He's a pretty good fighter. Boy, is that the understatement of the year. You know, there is something else going on in this passage about when you're oppressed. You say, well, why would we not stand up for our rights? Why would we not push all the buttons of justice? Well, yes, the Lord wants you to be vindicated, but there's something else going on in the text. And it has to do with patience and it has to do with trusting Him. There's spiritual things going on in your life that connect to you being oppressed. That maybe you don't just jump out of the situation as fast as you can or... Or demand that it be taken care of. The Lord's doing spiritual things in you. He's building your patience to wait on Him. He is causing you to be able to get a hold of your heart. To make it firm and established in the midst of persecution and problems. And that is good. To learn to be strong in the Lord. He is waiting. He is teaching you to wait until the day that He makes things right. Brother Crichton, Kitten Crichton prayed about Christian life being about waiting on the Lord. You know, that's a great spiritual maturity when you come to the place where you don't have to have something right now. You can wait on the Lord. And that's what he's also doing. And so he says, be patient. I'm doing other things in you. It's not just a matter. His highest thing is not vindicating you. It is perfecting you into the image of Christ. And you know, oppression does that. God ratchets up things in verse number 9 when he says... He gives you another command in this whole matter. Grudge not one against a, a, another brethren, 
lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. He wraps it all together. He connects it all together. This is still talking about waiting on the Lord. It's still talking about the oppression and all of that. Grudge not, grudge not one against another. It says, lest ye be condemned. That is, speaking to the oppressed, the one who is oppressed. Grudge here means to sigh or to complain. It means to murmur against. Who's, who is it talking, talk, telling you not to murmur against? It's the one oppressing you. You know, the Lord says not only don't, don't try to get your own vindication, you shouldn't even be talking, complaining, murmuring, yelling against that person. Let it in my hands. I'm going to take care of it. So in waiting for the Lord to avenge, we're not even supposed to verbally abuse or accuse or complain or murmur against the one doing us wrong. We're not to grudge against them. That is that word to sigh or complain or murmur against. God says if you do that, if you handle your oppression the wrong way, when he comes, you're going to be found with guilt too. That's what that means, that verse there. Read it again. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. You know, you're so, wait, you're so much waiting for that guy to get his comeuppance. And if you're out of your mouth spewing evil against that guy and murmuring against him, him your oppressor, and saying evil and all kinds of whatever, when the judge appears, yes, he's going to get his comeuppance, but he's going to turn to you and you've done what is wrong too. That's not the right way to ha handle when you're being oppressed. This is so amazing. It's so different than what our flesh wants to do. It's so different than what our country wants to do. It's so different than America and our Bill of Rights and all this. But this is the Christian life that is full of grace and full of the fruit of the Spirit and what the Lord Jesus Christ, was he not the sheep, the, the sheep that was dumb, that was quiet, that was drugged to the, the not drug, he was led to the slaughter without opening his mouth? Is this not the Jesus that we're supposed to be like? It is. God gives us one last illustration here. Or excuse me, two last illustrations. And we're almost done. Stick with me here. Verse number 10. Take my brother and the prophets. He says, get this illustration. Who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Think about the prophets. In the back of, or in the front of your Bible, in the Old Testament, let me tell you about a couple of your prof, the prophets that never were vindicated in their lifetime. There was Isaiah who was reportedly sawn in half. You know, tradition says that he was stuck in a, in a, in a hollow uh, a tree and they sawed him in half. Jeremiah the prophet was thrown to a pit to suffer a long time and eventually he was stoned to death. Ezekiel was martyred. Amos was tortured and martyred. Zechariah was killed near the temple. Think about the prophets who committed themselves to the Lord and all of their suffering when you are oppressed and committed to the Lord. None of these men ever received justice in their lifetime, but rather waited on the Lord to make things right for them. And they are examples to suffer affliction patiently. Then notice the last verse that we read. Behold, we count them happy or blessed, which endure. Endure during the midst of oppression. Just like the prophets, just like what you are supposed to be when you are oppressed. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Now there's a guy, there's an example for you. And have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful... And of tender mercy. Of course, it's referring to all that Job received in the end. But in the middle, wow, was he oppressed. You say, Pastor, how in the world can we count them happy which endure? How can anyone be happy in the midst of being taken advantage of and not vindicated? Happy here is not really talking about your feelings, folks. It, it, is, the, it is the word happy here that it's very clear in Greek. It means to present, pronounce somebody else blessed. Like saying, hey, man, Norm is blessed. Okay, that's what it means. We count them happy. We count a person blessed that endures. If you're thinking spiritually, if you understand what the Lord is going to, to do to reward the person who has suffered uh, through oppression and how the Lord is going to vindicate, you count that person as blessed when he goes through it. You're blessed when... You suffer oppression and wait on the Lord because in the end, just like Job, you will experience that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy and a great rewarder of those who endure patiently. Job never cursed God. He struggled with his feelings like you and I were, would, but he, didn't, he never did curse, curse God and die. His farmer's murmuring, pretty much the only one he talked to and kind of murmured was to the Lord himself. 
Job is a great example that in the end, it's going to be all right. And the Lord of the Sabbath is going to take care of you. And he is very pitiful and of great tender mercy. And he will reward and he will vindicate those who have been oppressed. So be patient. Establish your heart. Stop fretting about it. Give it to the Lord. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. He will take care. Now listen, some of you are not going through this at all. Some of you will go through it. Some of you have gone through it. 